Ladies and gentlemen, welcome back, John Kreisa. Good morning. Good morning. All right. That is a great way to shake off the cobwebs from uh, a great evening last night. So welcome back to day two from Data Work Summit. Very excited to have everybody back here. Hopefully everybody had a great day yesterday. In fact, I know we did, um, and I know you were getting very social from the day because we actually were trending number one on Twitter. So well done, everybody, in terms of going out there and sharing. You can see we've got some great pictures. It was a great day. All of the feedback I got from the breaks and talking with people at lunches and at the party was that people really enjoyed the content. Saw lots of packed sessions, um, standing room only in some cases. So I know that everybody enjoyed the content, and I know that uh, we've got another great day for you today. So in fact, what are we going to do today? So we'll have the community showcase again. Um, so we'll go and do and spend time with uh, the community sharing um, after the keynotes this morning, that is. Then we'll go and have the crash courses. I want to specifically point out that there's a NiFi crash course. And then we'll have additional breakout sessions. And then we'll have some lunch back in the community showcase where we spent a lot of time um, over the last day. And then we'll go into sessions this afternoon. And then importantly, uh, there are the technical birds of a feather sessions this afternoon. The information you need about that's in your app. So make sure that you uh, take a look at that. We're going to maintain our laser focus today in today's keynotes on innovation and open source. So we'll continue the theme that we had yesterday. I think you'll hear some great uh, topics on analytics and transformation. We've got a really great um, customer panel uh, coming up. So I think you'll hear something from industry leaders about how they are actually transforming their business, the successes that they're having. So a lot of great information for you today, um, starting with the keynotes this morning. As I said yesterday, we can't put on these uh, conferences without the help of our sponsors. So I want to give one more round of applause to our sponsors, particularly our Titanium sponsors. So thank you very much for helping us put on the conference. We truly appreciate your support and helping us make this a successful conference and again, bringing the global community together um, here in Munich today and, and indeed all around the world. So as we move into our keynotes, I want to start this morning with the keynote from Dell EMC. And this is really about how you can get more value out of your analytics, driving um, analytics forward through your organization. And indeed, you know, getting the value out of data really truly comes from you know, analyzing that data, not just capturing, but of course, analyzing the data, driving transformation, driving new applications within the business. So I want to welcome to the stage Ross Porter, Director of Systems Engineering for Isilon EMC. Ross, Good thanks morning. very much. Thanks, John. Welcome. Thank you. There you go. Thanks for the introduction. Good morning, everybody. Ross Porter from Dell EMC. It's great to be here. So I'm often asked the question when I talk to customers and um, partners and people who approach us to talk about data analytics projects about what makes a successful data analytics project. And what I want to spend a few minutes talking to you about this morning are some of the ingredients that we see as essential for successful projects. And there's no magic answer in terms of what makes a data analytics project successful. But what I want to share with you this morning are some of the things that I personally talk to customers about and some of the things that I hear in return from customers as well. But the first thing I want to set out and one of the essential things that, that, that I always talk to customers about is that there has to be alignment between the business and the IT side. And that's imperative for the success of any project when talking about data and data analytics. It's clear that you know, we've been hearing over the past couple of days, and we're all aware in the industry, that the way we consume, the way we analyze, the way we extract value from our data has significantly been transformed. We used to rely on spreadsheets and databases extracted into PowerPoint presentations to be able to give business reviews to sales leaders or boards or stakeholders. Now, increasingly, we're seeing a real-time consumption of that data and real-time value extraction from, from analytics. And before I set out and look at what some of those essential ingredients are, there's always two things that uh, I point out to and talk to customers about. One, as I've already said, that the business and IT are aligned with the projects and that they're working on. And secondly, that 
IT understands and really underpins the business through true IT transformation. So both business and IT transformation are required, and this will really drive a competitive advantage, which leaders and different parts of the business will rely on to make better informed decisions. And it's pretty clear that when companies get this right, they see a significant impact in terms of the investment that they're making, whether it's from increased revenues, whether it's from deciding to start new businesses or product lines, or whether it's enhancing and improving products and services that they already have. And I, you know, I often pose the question to customers, you know, what would double-digit growth mean for you? What would an increase in revenue look like for you? What would you be able to do? Would you be able to start new business lines, maybe stop something or stop investing in something which the data is telling you isn't profitable for you. It's clear that data is the differentiator and in terms of how we get and extract the value of that data has changed. How you mine is the competitive advantage and that competitive advantage is in your data. I recently um, had a chance encounter with uh, a CEO of a multinational coffee and donut shop and we were on the same flight, um, which was delayed, and we had a connecting flight, and we had to make our way across the airport. And as we hurried on that journey, we exchanged names and asked each other what we did. And he, he let me know that he was the, the CEO of, um, as I said, a multinational coffee and donut store. And I shared with him some of my favorites in terms of what I liked and what my daughter liked when we visit our stores. And in return, he shared with me um, some things about his business and how the data of his business is really changing and driving different um, projects inside his organization. And they've adapted their business model and their go-to-market based on customer feedback, purchasing patterns, um, and really enhancing their customer relationships through the deployment and development of a mobile app, which ultimately has allowed them to drive loyalty inside of their customer base. Imagine, right? It's a donut shop, data-driven donuts. Actually, maybe we should hashtag that, hashtag data-driven donuts and start tweeting that out. But it's a data shop, so uh, it's a donut shop. So imagine, you know, they're seeing the data that they're getting from their customers as absolutely critical to develop new business models in, in how they go to market and take um, information from their customers and extract value from it. And if donuts, you know, it got me thinking, if donuts can be data-driven, then each one of us and our organizations can absolutely be doing more with the data that we have and our most, most valuable asset. So if we start looking at what those ingredients are, and it really starts with some business ingredients. And the first one of those is a use case. Identifying and having a clear business use case is an absolutely essential starting point. It starts with the question, you know, what does your business need in today's world? And I've heard over the last couple of days, and I was, had the, uh, the fortune to attend the Women in Big Data breakfast this morning, and I heard the same comment from the panel there. The business and IT have to be aligned. It starts with a business use case, and then IT can map to that. So think, you know, I'm the donut shop on the corner. How do I win that donut war with data? How do I get customers into my shop? It's about investing in elements which are going to drive customer loyalty. So the number one business well, the number one ingredient that I see is around use case. Test those assumptions and then build recommendations based on that. The second business ingredient is action. Next step is really to take action based on the use case you have to drive the change. I see every successful data analytics project is action orientated. Having a business use case is one thing, but taking the step to take action and build out upon that is really the next step. And in the case of the donut shop, for example, you know, their competitive advantage, they identified as developing a mobile solution to help them increase sales, drive loyalty, get footprint into their stores, and ultimately try and sell more coffee and donuts to the people coming through their door, as opposed to making a choice to go somewhere else. So they're always thinking ahead. They're thinking about how they can extract value from their data to drive up customer satisfaction and drive up loyalty of their donuts. The third business ingredient that we see is around return on information. And the donut shop clearly saw tangible benefits and tangible outcomes of investing in a mobile app to engage with their customers in a new way. They took what was 
quite a simple model, selling coffee and donuts, and have now taken that to the next level and are really seeing tangible benefits of that. Collecting and analyzing data fundamentally changed their go-to-market and customer focus. So I asked the question, you know, what's your data worth? Are you aligning value to the, the monetary value to, to, to your data? And increasingly, you know, we're seeing customers being bought for just that, just their data that they have. So we have to be looking at how we're analyzing our data and making sure that we're seeing return on investment and return on information in that area. The second piece is around IT ingredients. How do we move from having a use case into something like data consolidation? And IT goals have to map to the business goals. Capturing all data in spreadsheets, data silos, warehouses, etc., it starts with something like data consolidation. Consolidation is the first step of the IT ingredient. It drives improved accessibility, longer data life, it drives enhanced security, and it means we can begin to really extract more value out of the data that we have. And of course, it also enables in-place analytics. And when we look at how we move from a use case through to action into something like self-service analytics, self-service analytics helps serve up a plan which gives the business the information that it needs to be successful. And it puts the information in the hands of the consumers straight away via new tools and services available to, to you inside your organization. So you have to turn that insight into tangible action. It means from a donut perspective, you know, it might be I get more maple donuts when I walk into the shop from a two to one offer or they recognize that I'm with my daughter and they, they put an offer straight into, into my hands. So it's a data orientated service. And then that data and the coffee or the donuts, however way you want to, want, to, want to cut it, is served up in applications like Hortonworks or other data platforms where you can extract value and analytics out of it. And these applications are now supporting real-time operations, you know, 360 degree views of the customer, and they break down that data which was previously stored in silos, aggregating it all together and really extracting value from it. So the question I ask organizations is, where do you measure the real value, leveraging the data con to continuously measure outcomes to show a real return to the business and show real results from a business perspective? And if we look at the coffee and the donut store, you know, we, what do they ask themselves? They grew their revenue, they increased customer satisfaction, and it gave them an opportunity to build real customer loyalty with their organization as well. So, in summary, remember the three ingredients here from a business ingredient perspective and an IT ingredient perspective. And essentially, that the business and IT have to be aligned and working together to solve new business challenges and opportunities that we see. Dell EMC are you, you know, very well positioned from a product and portfolio perspective to offer services and solutions which go beyond just infrastructure. We have the ability to help you achieve organizational goals. We help you achieve deeper insights utilizing all of your data. And we have a raft of pre-built, validated solutions for analytics and Hadoop environments. So since we only had 10 minutes on the stage today, um, I'd like to hear from you about your successful data analytics projects. I'd like to hear from you what ingredients you might add uh, what are your biggest challenges that you're seeing? And I'd also like to tell, you know, tell me about your data analytics transformations as well. You can engage with me directly on Twitter or, or LinkedIn. Um, I'm here for the rest of the day. And there's an opportunity to learn from my colleague, Corey Minton, this afternoon uh, in room 3B at 3 o'clock, uh, 13B at 3 o'clock. Um, and you can also engage with us in the expo hall as well in the showcase. Um, we're here throughout the breaks, and it would be a great opportunity to meet with you and hear some of the, the projects that you're working on as well. So remember, data-driven donuts, and uh, thank you for your time this morning. Okay. Thanks, Ross. Appreciate it. Thanks for cooking up some <laughs> good insight there. <laughs> Appreciate that. Okay, so some very useful insight. Hopefully you found that informative. I think um, from a HortonWorks perspective, we would definitely agree, starting with the use case and discovery 
um, as a way to drive success within the business is definitely the right way to go. So, so thank you, Ross, for that. Um, I want to keep on the theme of analytics and getting value from business and analytics. Um, and our next speaker here will also give, I think, some very useful insight into how you can continue to take, gather big data, what some of the strategies are, but also really continue to drive that value out of analytics. So what I'd like to do is uh, welcome Carlo from uh, Hewlett Packard, please, to the stage. Carlo? Hi. Hey, thanks Thank very you, much. Good to see you. There you go. Thank you. Well, thank you. So, um, let me start saying this, this type of sentence um, that I tweet yesterday because I think this is where everything is starting. So for me, and this is uh, one of my job, is actually to try to identify what is the real thing which is important in the data analytics story. So for me, one important sentence that we need to remember is that the data is the foundation stone of the digital economy. If you think about this sentence, for me, is actually including everything that, that we need. And I'll try to explain the next few minutes what I mean by that. So I'd like to spend the initial part of my uh, job here is actually to give you an idea what are the big data trends and how do we see actually the Hadoop infrastructure and the Hadoop uh, kind of technology moving forward or in terms of directions. A kind of visionary, if you like, pitch, but I think it makes sense to tell you where we are, we are planning to go. And the traditional data warehouse, uh, the traditional OLTP kind of environment, business intelligence, we know, right, how this is, is, is being implemented today. And I think one of the major use cases I see in many large accounts right now is to bring the enterprise data warehouse into a new data lake. And actually, this is one of the key trends that I see in many large accounts today, especially in Europe. They're trying to build a big data lake. And, and again, we will see later where the data lake is going to be in the next few years, or actually very soon. And we call this data lake 3.0, which is actually the third generation of the data lake in the way we think. And I'll, I'll give you some insights what is, in my opinion, the new form of this. Another trend that I see in this market is, is actually that the open source driving innovation. And that's part of the Hadoop uh, family. It's part of the complexity and the confusion that many customers have today in how they're going to implement it. And of course, the customer need advice how to be re resolved, right? And companies like HPE or others are actually there and trying to reduce this amount of complexity. But I think Hadoop, especially, and Hadoop and the friends, what I call friends, which is, means all the entire ecosystem around Hadoop, is actually evolving in a, in a very good direction, in my opinion. And one of the directions I've seen is what I call storage disaggregation. I'll, I'll talk a little bit about later what is storage disaggregation. It basically means that because the complexity is becoming bigger and bigger and the amount of data are exploded, you need to have a certain point in time to spread around what is a compute workload and what is going to be a storage workload in the Hadoop preference architecture. And that's, that's basically what we try to, to mean by these kind of trends. Another trend I'd like to talk is actually what I call Hadoop as a service, which is actually something that the customer like because it's actually they can pay by consumption basis. And it's something that in the trends of Hadoop, it, it makes a lot of sense. Um, I also see real time everywhere. And what I mean by that is in-memory processing is one of the things that uh, the customer is looking at because it allows them to have a faster analytics and response time in the things that they want to have and the faster business outcomes coming from there. And definitely, I mean, tools like uh, Spark and, or HANA are actually looking in that kind of direction, right? Another trend that I see, which I think is really important for, for us, especially in the, in the financial uh, services or even in oil and gas or manufacturing company, automotive company, is what I call analytics on the edge or power the analytics on the edge, which means basically that the IoT data platforms are going to be running actually on the shop floor, close to the manufacturing shop floor, for example, or close to the rig on the, on the, in, the, in the oil and gas industries. And tools like streaming, Kafka, uh, Druid are actually an example of how we can run intelligent edge at that, that kind of space. 
The other point which I want to highlight is definitely the deep learning aspect. So deep learning is actually a massive data volume that needs to be ingested in some ways, and the artificial intelligence algorithms are actually there to try to identify a faster solution to the cust what the customer wants. And in my opinion, one of the things it is going to create is actually a new reference architecture behind this, which I'll show you later. So one other aspect that I want to highlight a little bit more in deeper is what I call uh, open innovation approach to deliver a faster or the next generation analytics in a faster way. And what I mean by that is the capability to have real-time analytics for business data in a terabyte range. An example of this is definitely the SAP HANA kind of uh, story. But it's, there is more, in my opinion, that is coming in the future in this type of direction. And having things like in-memory analytics or optimize run parallel uh, with ERP application to realize and analyze real-time operational and transactional data is one of the things that is becoming more important. A second aspect which I like to highlight is what I call SQL on Hadoop scale-out which is actually the capability to have advanced high-performance analytics, specifically on a columnar database, because that's what the customer really wants, understanding, and making queries on a columnar base, because this is allow actually a faster response time at the end of the day. And this is where native integration like Spark and Kafka are actually going a big deal in analyzing streaming in, in real time. So I see this more and more in the new data lake that we are building for many large accounts in EMEA. The, the third aspect, which I think is still important on the data lake, is actually the human information, what I call the social media analytics. Because in my opinion, we have an enterprise, enterprise search, advanced enterprise search that needs to be done, and we need to have a, a knowledge discovery behind this. So specialized machine learning functions are going to become available very soon in order to be able to run these queries as fast as possible. And the role of the data scientist or the chief uh, data officer is becoming a key role with many uh, type of functions inside that. So with all the trends that I discussed so far, I think the most important thing, in my opinion, is that Hadoop is becoming uh, asymmetric. And why I say that? Because I can see many large accounts today already do looking at, for example, multi-tenancy kind of architecture. They are looking at, for example, in making cluster of Hadoop actually talking to each other in the faster way as much as possible. And things like a product lifecycle manager that many actually distribution from Hadoop are, are actually in plan to have are actually making easier to have this cluster talking to each other. And other aspects of why Hadoop for me is becoming asymmetric. What I mean by asymmetric is the fact that we have compute workload and we have storage workload. For example, we can run Yarn application on a compute and we can run a storage, HDFS, HBase on the storage side, running independently and scale out independently. So in order to do that, I think we have to have this kind of asymmetric story. And, and I think many large accounts, especially in the financial services, with, uh, when we want to implement uh, risk management or log analytics, I see these guys actually going in this direction because that's the way to go and manage a multiple workload at the same time. The other aspects I and emphasize on this slide is actually the, what I call the uh, containerization of the application. So more and more, of course, things like Docker are becoming available and many, many applications can be containerized. And the fact that we can run this type of elastic Hadoop cluster on top of it will help us much on this kind of direction. The third aspect which created this story of around Data Lake 3.0 is actually what I call uh, data tiering in HDFS. Because this is a trend that is part of HDFS 3.0, but it's actually what the customer wants, be able to have multiple data tiering at the storage level. Another thing that I'd like to emphasize here is actually the fact that we need an elastic platform for big data analytics, which has an asymmetric workload inside, but can, for example, can create HDFS tiering or HDFS erasure coding, which is, part, is coming on part of HDFS 
So we're going to have denser storage blocks on one side from a storage perspective, and on the, on the compute side, we're going to have big memory nodes with in-memory processing, or for example, GPU nodes that are specified for deep learning kind of things. So I can combine all of these multiple work in a multi-tenancy environment. And the fact that we can have this elastic platform for big data analytics running all of these work at the same time, for me, it's, it's a big step forward in innovation on that space. The next technology that I am expecting is that the persistent, mem persistent memory is going to be part of this. And persistent manager will substitute the storage tier we are talking about. It's going to take more years to come, but we are working actually in this direction. So, so to summarize, what I said today, I like to say that all the things needs to have an enterprise-grade Hadoop story. And this is where I think a company like HPE can help you in identifying a solution for your statement. And with that, I want to thank you. I want to make sure that if you want to come to the booth, we can give you more details on the trends and direction that we see. Okay? Thank you, John. All right. Carlo. Thank you. Thank you very much. I appreciate My it. My pleasure. Thank, Thank you. you. Okay. So I think um, Carl did a great job of tying both the technology to some of his experience and some of the use cases that he's seen here in Europe um, in terms of implementing it. So everything from Spark and Kafka and some of the general SQL and in-memory capabilities. So kind of good insight there. And I think it's actually a good lead-in as he tied us to the um, use cases that he saw from, uh, from Europe to our next session, which is a panel of enterprise adoption. And I think moving from the technology to some of the successes we see, um, it's my pleasure now to introduce the um, MC for this next session, um, someone who's brought a lot of vision and insight to Hortonworks, you know, continues to drive us forward. And I'm very excited to bring uh, Raj Verma, our uh, president and COO. Raj? Hi. Thank you. Thank you, John. Good Thank luck. you. Stay, stay here for a second. What do you think, what, what kind of a job has this guy done um, during the last couple of days? Good job? All right. Thank you. Well done. Thank you. Thank you for everything. How are we doing this morning? Good? Who, who, who went to the party last night? Good. How do you feel this morning? Little, little ginger? Yeah, I know that feeling. I know that feeling very well. Um, I actually, um, I, I love Munich, and um, I too had a couple of beers too many last night, but we'll all soldier on. It's all data-driven. Um, so I'll, it's my pleasure to invite on stage um, our panel, Nadim, Eddie, and Zog. Please join me on stage. So um, the purpose of this morning was to uh, share with the audience some insight into how these guys make their data-driven donuts, really. So, um, Nadim, if you don't mind, introduce yourself and sure. tell us how are you using data as a competitive differentiator for your organization. So, thank you, Raj, for inviting us. Um, I'm Nadim Gulzar. I am a senior development manager in Danske Bank. And uh, in terms of data, it's actually quite an interesting story because uh, before you could say Hadoop and the advanced analytics framework, we were simply not able to harvest data. Mm -hmm. So we've been gathering data for decades, but we were simply not allowed or could not uh, harvest the, the insight and, and the information. So customers are at the core of our business. And what we have done with the uh, Hortonworks partnership is actually to leverage that data and provide valuable insight to the business. Whether it is uh, something uh, going into our marketing department or increasing uh, actual sales with the customer, there are many, many use cases in that. But that's what we have done. Thank you very much, Nadim. Eddie, um, you, you know, we had dinner the other mm -hmm. night and you were telling me some very, very interesting use cases of how you have transformed um, a established institution like mm -hmm. Centrica into a modern-day data-driven uh, company. 
uh, some very, very exciting work that you guys have done. So my congratulations, firstly. And if you would be uh, kind enough to share with the audience, how have you used data as a yeah, differentiator? Sure. So I'm Eddie Edwards. I head up our data provisioning team within Centrica. Um, Centrica being a global organization, mainly UK, Ireland, and America. And h how we've been leveraging the data is really putting some of the control back to the customers. So we're now in a, a position where we're able to offer real-time decisioning in terms of our marketing. We've been able to close the loop in terms of how we communicate with our customers. So if a customer contacts us interested in a product, that information is straight away available to all the channels, including our field force. And the other areas that we've been uh, working heavily in is working with intellectual devices uh, that use machine learning to be able to harvest the information. Uh, examples there would be, say, servicing products, uh, whether that be a boiler or other appliances in the, uh, in the home. What we're able to do now is rather than just go out and do a service once a year, understand when parts are starting to fail and turn it into a proactive service. So quite a number of areas. Yeah, th th thank you, Eddie. Uh, Zog, uh, if you would be kind enough to introduce yourself and talk to us about how you've used data as a differentiator as well. Sure, so I'm Zog Gibbons and I sit within the global brands uh, part of our organization. So we are promoting and supporting our brands across not just the UK and the US, but um, South America, Europe, and Asia also. So where we are, we're new into our journey uh, with Hadoop and Horton Works, so we're to about 12 months in now. And a lot of the work we've been doing so far is getting all our retail transactions and our loyalty information, our store planograms, and our um, product merchandise uh, sizing and packaging, all into our cluster. And so far at the moment where we are, our we're using this data to enhance the product set and the mix of products that sat on our shelves in our stores and also looking or starting to move our customer propensity and our decisioning on what offers to give to our customers. We're just starting to move that into Hadoop. It's really given us an opportunity now to start breaking down the silos of all our data and bring it into one sort of central platform. Fantastic. So I, um, this morning, as you guys heard, Ross explain that a successful data-driven project starts with a business use case. So um, Nadim, you were sharing with me how you have used, and you know, when you talk about a bank, it's not very often that you talk about maintenance management. But I was really intrigued by your story about how you used data to service your ATMs. Mm. Would you be kind enough to share that uh, business use case with the audience, please? So uh, one of the use cases that we really dug into was uh, in, in ATM. And not only you could say predictive maintenance, as in when do we need to service them and so on, but actually also when do we need to fill them with cash? And there are multiple angles to this. One is so, of course, if you have uh, a given pattern, um, then you're up for uh, it getting hit with uh, robbers, et cetera, et cetera. And uh, we really wanted to avoid that and at the same time also save some cost in this. Right. So the way we did that uh, was look into, okay, could we put some uh, sensor equipment into the ATMs and also leverage, you could say, uh, analytics in order to figure out when exactly do we need to do it, what is the optimal pattern, and at the same time, the bonus is that you are not predictable anymore when you're actually going to fill them up. And, and that's safety and security and all Safety, the security, security for our people, right. all that kind of thing, and, and it's really extremely good. So it's almost like an ATM says, I'm hungry, fill me up. And yeah. you say, all right, we're sending cash your way. And you yeah, basically it's uh, uh, give me the donut, okay. and we gave the donut, right? <laughs> That's <laughs> awesome. We are all yeah, data-driven donuts. I'll <laughs> exactly. So Eddie, what's your data-driven donut? Would you like to share a use case? <laughs> yeah, uh, so the one that I'll uh, talk through is 
Uh, wh what the big data has enabled us to do is look at different ways of changing how we approach um, the collection of energy and also the distribution side. And a lot of partnerships that we're striking up at the moment are with, say, telecoms companies. Mm -hmm. Now, telecoms companies, they have a lot of broadband boxes at the end of the streets that have batteries. And one the area that we've focused on is understanding how we could use that power to try and smooth some of the peaks within our consumption patterns, so avoiding having uh, large uh, power production plants. And the reason I can talk about this one is that only last week we signed up a contract to put these units into one of the major UK um, telecom uh, broadband boxes. But th we're taking that stage further. We're, we're also working with, say, uh, the appliance manufacturers, so fridges, and looking at how we can start to control the power going into a fridge but at the same time work out when parts are failing on that side. So it, it's moving us more away from what our main core business is, more into the, t the technology sector. So now, now really Centrica is as much a technology company as it's a utility company. Yeah, most definitely. That's, that's fantastic. So Zog, you and I were chatting uh, in the green room and you, you were talking to me about how you have used data to identify what items go on shelf space and where. A fascinating story. Would you be kind enough to share your business case with our audience this morning? Sure, so it's um, a section of our Global Insights team, um, it's a large team, but it's a smaller section of the team. They look at where we locate stores and how we lay out stores, products in stores. So they, they had been doing some work on this for the UK based store, so for Boots UK, and using the relational technology they, were, they, were, they had available to them, they were starting to struggle to get the performance out of that and deal with the volume of loyalty transaction and retail transaction data within our um, systems. So to enable them to, first of all, complete what they wanted to do for the UK data, but also give the opportunity to run the trials out in um, Thailand and Mexico and Chile and other countries. They needed something we could scale up considerably larger. So this was the start of our journey into Hadoop. And today they've um, about to go live with the pretty much full rollout across the UK. And this is covering many different store formats. It's, we don't have a standard template for a store. If you go around the UK, any boot store you'll see has a different layout. So we need to make sure when our customer goes into whichever store it is, whether it's at the airport or at a station or on a high street, that it's got the product mix that that customer is expecting so they can get what they want on that visit to that store. So that's what that team are looking to do to maximize the customer benefit and also obviously maximize the profit we can make or revenue we can gain out of that store. And we've seen across the platform of stores, we've been rolling this through, significant growth in revenue across those stores. Fantastic, thank you. Um, the other question that, again, I've been talking to a lot of customers and our partners and uh, prospects here, and um, you know, the open source as a phenomena, as a concept, um, is, is a community-based development concept, which is um, good for customers, good for vendors, and it's, it makes the playing field very even. Uh, we are in this together, we are all in that community, and we serve different roles in that community. However, as a business model, it's uh, relatively new. We are trying to do something that's never been done before, to have a truly open source company solve some of the seminal challenges of our times. You had other options to go for proprietary over open source. What was it that took you to open source? What was your thought process that you thought, why, why you thought that open source would be best suited to meet your requirements? 
so from our point of view, um, it was actually quite simple. Because uh, when we started our journey uh, back in, in 2015, mm -hmm. it was uh, at a point where if you wanted to do Hadoop and you, if you wanted to venture into advanced analytics, there weren't really a strong off-the-shelf commercial product. Of course, if you asked all the players, they would say, we can do everything you want for all eternity, <laughs> and you just pay half a billion, and, and we'll do it for you. Simple choice, yeah. Yeah, exactly, yeah. right? But at the end of the day, when we scoured the market and we un understood what we need to do and, and what are our, our options, basically, uh, we quickly learned that what we need to do is look into the open source community because it was really accelerating at a pace where no commercial product could follow. So we needed to leverage not only ourselves and our own, you could say, setup and, and uh, organization, but at the same time, other organizations, open source communities, um, organizations such as yourself with Houghton Works, right? Uh, and pretty much engage all in. So take from the community and give back to the community. For us, it's actually quite important. And even though we have not really, you could say, fully committed back to the uh, open source community, uh, this year, one of our goals is actually to look into that and make sure that we also contribute back to the open source community. Even though, of course, uh, other, you could say, uh, competitors could leverage that. Yeah. But I think in this playing field and with this accelerated, uh, you could say, pace, it's important that all of us contribute to the same product. And, and if you had a choice of making that decision now versus 2015, would you still it, go it would be the same. Out? It would, it be would the same. absolutely be the same. Again, you can do this at a much faster pace. Mm -hmm. You gain capabilities instantly. Uh, things move on a second by second basis. And not only that, I think if we look at the grander scheme of things, and people talk about, oh, it's not so mature in an enterprise world. Yes, granted, uh, there are some things to that, and there is a balance. But still, the capabilities yet that you can get from this community is, is invaluable, to be honest. Thank you. Eddie, what, what's your experience been with open source? I, I was, again, very intrigued by what Baljit um, said yesterday about how you truly have taken that community approach and you've given back to the community mm -hmm. and you've actually started courses in universities, et cetera. That was very inspiring. What's been your thought process around choosing open yep. source and implementing open source? Yeah, so for us in Centrica, our journey's been going around four years and we're at a point when all our legacy hardware was coming end of life and the, the markets were changing in terms of, we were moving into the smart meter uh, arena, and the existing option that we had was to upgrade our traditional warehouse at a cost of around five million pound, that would have given the company around 50 terabyte, or go for an open source approach. Um, the numbers that we were crunching were showing that we needed to bring in around 20 to 30 terabytes per day in terms of data. And today, that's how much we're sort of ingesting overnight. And we just really liked the open source community approach. Uh, we, we felt as though there was more people moving that way. If there was problems, somebody would have already experienced that problem in the past. And if not, there was a strong enough community that would come together to address a problem. And what we're finding is, uh, you know, we are starting to contribute back. And it has opened us up to a number of new channels of uh, operation. And also, um, in talking to you over dinner the other mm -hmm. night, uh, you and Baljit mentioned that it's also aided you in attracting some really good talent yes. into Centrica as well. Would you want to expand on that? Yeah, just a bit? most definitely. If you don't mind. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So you mentioned Raj around the Royal Holloway side. So what we're now able to offer people is the opportunity to go and carry out lectures at uh, various universities in the UK. Mm -hmm. And what we're finding is that the people that are going through them courses 
I come in working for ourselves for a few years, building up the skills. But for us, they are the people that make the difference, are able to come in without any barriers of what they've been taught over the last 10, 20 years and open up with, uh, you know, the, the wider team to new ways of working, ways of thinking. And w one area we've been focusing on is blockchain. Blockchain, yeah. Yeah, and you know, the, the guys have built a full simulation model, uh, working where people can share cars, trade electricity uh, in a community. And we have a, a program running at the moment in Cornwall. So if you go onto the Centrica website and um, centrica.com slash Cornwall, it will give you details of how we're changing as an organization in terms of getting B2B people <coughs> working closer together. Thank you for that. Uh, so um, apart from your experience with open source that I'd be very interested in learning, um, what's been your experience implementing Hadoop? And the reason I ask this question is, you know, there's a lot of press around how Hadoop projects succeed or, or lack thereof. And, um, you know, we've got over a thousand customers. And when I speak to customers, I see more success stories than failures, to be honest with you. Um, and, and you have successfully implemented a Hadoop project in, in almost record time, not almost, in record time. <laughs> um, a lot of the members of the audience are either in the process of starting a project or midway through it. What's been, what would your advice be in terms of implementing a successful Hadoop project? I'd say, uh, well, I think our journey over the last year, it has had its trying times. Um, overall, it's been successful, but we haven't had a smooth run all the way through. And we've learned a lot through that, and we are assessing how we're doing and looking at the issues and trying to work through those as a team. I think the piece that's been vital to us has been the collaboration. Um, there's room for improvement, but we've had to, we've um, collaborated well across both our business users, which for us are, are technical users anyway, but they are the part of the business, and through our IT team. Um, we have the complexity of various different horizontals in our organization. So there's an area for infrastructure, another area for networking, another area for ETL, etc. So we have that complex matrix organization. But what we try to do is get people together, collaborate, and learn that way. We've also got the advantage that our US team um, at Walgreens are I know, three years maybe down the Horton Works Hadoop journey. So there's a lot of learnings we could take from them. And we've had a lot of help from the Horton Works team through our account management and the office staff at Horton Works to really help us on that journey. And we had a particular day where we had a whole bunch of issues. So we just arranged a hackathon where myself and our technical guys and our support guys went down, spent a day at the Horton Works office, and we just thrashed out our issues, time boxed them all, yeah. thrashed them out in that day. And that took us from struggling over several weeks to having it all fixed in a day. And that was just a great achievement for the team, that was. That's, that's very interesting. Ludi, what, what's, what's been your experience? Because, um, you know, in talking to you and members of your team, they are very proud of not only what they have delivered, but how they went about delivering it. What's been, what's your advice to the audience in terms of how to implement a successful project? So I think for, from my point of view, one thing is very clear, right? Um, this is an ever-changing world, and we know when we interact with our business, uh, it's not always really certain what you want to achieve. So starting it's small. kind of like a moving target. Exactly. Yeah. It can be easily a moving target. And for us, it's important to start small, uh, implement something um, which uh, could be done in a couple of weeks, so like a proof of value or proof of concept. And then you can build on top of that. 
because then not only yourself, your team, but even the business and the business representatives, steercos, etc., they see, okay, what sort of thing are we getting out of this? What are the capabilities we can leverage? And many times I've seen actually that they get ins extremely inspired by this. Yeah, yeah. And, and you can see the Christmas light in their eyes, right? <laughs> and, and it's like uh, it's snowing and, and whatnot, right? So that, that is an extremely nice journey to see that people really embrace this. And sometimes actually we recently launched a, a fraud engine and uh, some of the, the stakeholders initially was, ah, we don't want to talk to you guys really. Why are you coming in? Are you taking our jobs? That kind of thing. Mm -hmm. to, the, to the extent, actually, last week they were pushing us and we had to say no because they were like, oh, there's can we do this? Can we so do there's that? there's a pull from the business. Yeah, extreme business. pull. I mean, to, to the extent <laughs> where we have to like turn them down uh, or at least say, okay, let's take it easy. <laughs> let's do this and that. You, you know, one of the things that a lot of our customers on a similar note have said is um, don't try and eat an elephant in one bite, exactly. which of course exactly. with Hadoop has a totally different <laughs> as well. But, you know, just, just break it into bite-sized chunks. So what you're really saying is think big, start small, have the ability to scale yes. instantly. What, what's been your experience, Eddie, um, in, in that regard? Experience has been really good for us uh -huh. in terms that, you know, the, the main advice we've got in this space is be brave. Be brave? Uh, yeah. Oh. What the I can see tweets going out, be brave. <laughs> <laughs> the, the, the part that we found before was that um, the business only had small ideas and that was the, always resulted in people aggregating data up. Every time you do that, it's data loss and uh, you could potentially be losing all the, where the value really is because you're just going from their experience. Whereas the approach now is we bring all the data in and we will give the support. We provide all the tools and capabilities and train the business on how to use them in answering questions that they've not actually thought of. So we, we use a number of tools for that that pinpoint uh, key areas. And the results have been, you know, I think we've got six new product lines that we're running. Oh, wow. uh, we're in the process of spinning up a separate company on that side. Um, other advice I'd give is try and avoid the internal uh, politics and governance side. So <laughs> we, we, we find, especially in the UK, we have far too many committees that have to get involved it before a project goes live. So a typical life cycle for getting a Hadoop project up and running for me at the moment is probably about three months. Three months is far too long. Uh, however, compared to the traditional way, they were taking nine to 12 months. So that is an improvement. We have it's almost one fourth of the time. Yeah, wow. but we've proven with, a, with our colleagues in Direct Energy over in uh, North America that they had not used Hadoop. We were able to, via video conference, um, create an environment, get the data all ingested, provide them the tools and capability on the top. And as a result, they were able to remove all their existing analytics tools and just use the environment that we provided within a four week period. And they were driving real business value from that. That's fantastic. So, Zog, um, you know, one of my favorite parts of the job um, is, you know, meeting customers and asking them this question, you know, what's your dream project, <laughs> right? If if money and resources uh, was not an issue and, um, and you were allowed to be brave, to use Eddie's terminology, what would be your dream project to implement uh, by way of a story? What business benefit would that bring to Boots and Walgreens? I was just saying, we talked about this yesterday, and I was thinking about this um, overnight, really, and it took me back to um, when I first joined the company um, 15 months ago, whenever it was. We go through an introduction to the company and we talk, it talks about Jesse Boot and John Boot, who founded um, Boots back in 1747, I think it was about, not nearly 300 years ago, I guess. Hello. That old Hello. company. 
their mission on that day when they started was to take health and beauty to the public at an affordable price and be the number one in Nottingham for that delivery. That's where we started. Moving on to where we are today, 270 years later, the mission for the company is still the same, to be the number one customer choice for beauty and health. And I think that's where we, st we still want to be, and that's where we want we'll want to be in 30, 40, 50 years beyond my time there. So t to me, to get there, we are in a fantastic position that we have the brands and we build brands and we build products. We source material, we manufacture the products, we manufacture for other brands. And we have the benefit that we can see those brands and those products go to the hand of the customer. So to me, it's to, um, I'd like to be able to get all our data from our sourcing and our brand innovation and our research right through the manufacturing process, right through the retail program, so we can see when we sell a bottle of shampoo, what has been the full journey of that product, how can we make our savings all the way through that journey to pass those savings on to the customers to make sure we continue to be the number one retailer of choice for their brands and their products at an affordable price. Fascinating. Nadim, what's, what's, what's your dream? I'm sure you wanted to make our have a dream speech on stage. Oh, yes. <laughs> I, I love that. What, what's your data dream, so as to speak? So, uh, again, as I mentioned earlier, for us, uh, the, the customer is like the center of the universe. And uh, what we've been talking about is if we really want to go all in, we want to be the most trusted financial partner for our customers. Mm -hmm. And the way we want to do that is to predict all the needs of the customer, even before actually the customer knows it Delicious. him or herself. Yeah. Because for us, it's a lifetime engagement. It's a lifetime engagement. We want to be there when you get a new job, when you get married, when unfortunately you might get divorced, lose a job, all these kind of things. And w to be honest, we are not in it to sell you a product. We want to support you on your life journey. So that is what we want to achieve. And having data is the key for that. Being able to analyze data, use analytics on top of that, that is the absolute key to achieve that. Because in the old days, when you interacted with your bank, it was a personal meet. Uh, then we moved into calling each other, and now we don't do anything. I mean, we did a survey recently, and actually more than 85% of our customer base, they have almost never been in a physical branch. Yeah, so I mean, how I'm do you how do you get that yeah. connection? It's data. Very fascinating. All right, uh, we've got um, about a minute left, so let's do a rapid fire round, if you don't mind. This is bonus question. I know okay. I'm bringing <laughs> a surprise <laughs> in you guys. Uh, favorite part of the event, Eddie? Last two days, of course, the beer with me is. Yeah. <laughs> Luminous dinner. Is that right? Yeah. yeah a lot of networking. Is that I think for me is um, we've got a team of six over here this week and it's a combination of our insights team and our um, IT team. It's been great just to have the t chance to bond with the wider team and build a, a I guess a closer team. Fantastic. Nadim, yours? For me it's been to interact with the people like yourself and other leaders in this uh, industry to talk about, okay, what, is, what have you achieved? But not only that, what is your visions in this field? Right. Where, where do you want to go? Because again, I believe in the, even though I'm in banking, I can learn from other industries, definitely. And uh, hopefully I can steal some good ideas from you <laughs> and, and build on that, especially yeah. the donut part. Uh, yeah. I love that. Yeah. <laughs> Th thank you very much. It's uh, been a privilege and an honor to speak to you guys. It's, uh, you know, in our business, uh, this is what we live for. And um, I can assure the audience that we will strive to meet your expectations based on innovation and superior customer service, and all on the open source platform. So be first, win, and uh, have a great conference. Thank you all for your time. Thank you. All right. Thank you very much. Lots of uh, data-driven donuts of 
uh, nuggets of information there for you, really kind of bite-sized pieces. We'll just keep with that theme. Um, so uh, I think hopefully that gave you some good insight, whether it's how bank machines are being restocked or how store layouts are being planned um, or how power generation systems are being made uh, more effective. I think there was a lot of great insight directly from users and from the industry um, across Europe. So in keeping with that theme, really, I want to go to you know, the open source and sort of data lakes. A lot of organizations use data lakes as kind of a, an industry term in terms of how people think about and organizations think about bringing all of their data together. Um, and it is kind of one of the ways that we see organizations using data and, and talking about how they use it, building data lakes on top of uh, Hadoop-based platforms. Uh, so I want to turn now, sticking with open source and data lakes and getting kind of value out of those data lakes uh, to Teradata. I want to invite Mike Merritt-Holmes up to talk about um, data lakes and introducing uh, Kylo. Mike, please. Welcome. Thanks, John. Thanks. Thank you. Here you go. Cheers. Morning, everyone. Um, I'm very excited today to talk to you about a new platform that um, we at Think Big, a Teradata company, have uh, open sourced uh, and brought to the community. Um, before I do that, though, I wanted to just put some business context as to um, why we did this and why we put it out to the community. Um, if you talk about Think Big or Teradata, we have a common goal, which is uh, to help businesses achieve um, business outcomes um, and do that through, through analytics and at scale. And really, when we do that and we talk about um, helping customers to do that, um, that's not necessarily uh, an easy thing to do for some businesses. They've got complex IT infrastructures, etc. So when you look at um, what's happening in the big data world, it's fair to say that you know, distributions and Hadoop and all the ecosystem is maturing. Uh, the the te technologies are maturing and even actually we have a viable option now to actually put our data lakes entirely in a PaaS cloud scenario, uh, which, which has never really been uh, uh, properly viable, I guess, um, across the board. Um, in addition, we actually have um, our ecosystem is evolving and um, not just um, the, the, should we say, the old new, new technology such as Spark, which was new a year ago but has now matured and, 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 and helping many businesses, but also there are new technologies that have arrived to really kind of bring the kind of complexities at the lower level up a upper stack so that we can actually start to enable business users to start to, um, to, to, to leverage the data that's on their platform. But even though that's the case, organizations are still struggling to realize real value from their data so um, real true value so that they can access the data, they can run some hive queries, but are they actually getting real true business ROI? Um, and if you look all the way back to 2013, Gartner did a study and asked many, many customers or many uh, businesses um, what their challenges were. And 56% of businesses said it's how we get value from data. They also had challenges around skills and, and obtaining those skills, around defining their strategy and also bringing all that data into one place. The 360 view was still a struggle. You roll forward to last year when Gartner did the same questionnaire, the same survey, and 55% of, of, com of companies are still saying we're struggling to get value from our data. So the number hasn't changed in all that time. And in fact, whilst, the, uh, whilst the defining our strategy and obtaining skills and stuff like that is, 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 uh, has come about, um, we have actually... Uh, uh, sorry, we have actually uh, moved on from the strategy side, but none of the other things have actually moved on. So, so we're still trying to obtain the skills. We're still trying to integrate. Um, and really, those challenges haven't really gone away. Um, but that's not new to us. I mean, we exist to help customers solve those challenges. And whether it's helping them to understand and, and build their roadmap and all those use cases, the discovery stuff that many, many people have been talking about this morning, or even putting in some, uh, some real analytics, some, some, uh, some data science and machine learning and operationalizing that into, into your business world and making it always on, or even uh, managing your cluster for you. We can do all those things. And so, so whilst we've been doing that, we realized that we actually needed to help businesses to start leveraging this data, not just through IT, but allowing businesses to start bringing their own data in, allowing their data scientists to, to, um, to wrangle the data without having to involve IT. And that's why we've, we've brought Kylo to the world. So Kylo is, is actually a, a, data manage, a data lake management platform. 
It helps organizations to uh, stream data in, to, to, to use batch processes to bring, bring data in, to data scientists to wrangle the data, to discover the data. And really, it's built to enable people to do all those things without IT. So, so we want to be able to enable users to say, I want to bring some data into my lake. I want to wrangle the data and turn it into something else so that, um, so that actually um, I can then use it for my, for, to, to train my models, for instance, or to bring into Tableau or to any other BI tool. So we're really aiming at, at the data analysts, the data scientists who are wrangling and preparing their data, the data stewards, through, through the, the platform that we've, we've put on top of Spark and NiFi, you get both the power of Spark, but the extensibility of NiFi. Uh, and through that, you also get full lineage. We've got data quality, and we can, we can do things like uh, validation and standardizations. Um, but also, we can monitor those feeds. So we're able to look at all the feeds that are coming in and monitor them. So your operations team can see everything that's going on. Um, and you can look at the quality and monitor the quality. So from an ingestion perspective, we have um, a, a great UI that allows you to um, literally publish the templates that you build in NiFi, and we've built a number for you already. And you can publish those into Kylo and, and generate dynamically business-friendly wizards, things that you can go through step by step to say, you know what, I want to pull this data from this table or this data from this source. I want to bring it into my lake, and I want to do some stuff with it. But while I do that, I also want to prepare it. I want to put some data quality standards around it. I want to check that my, my data is in the right format. I want to change my dates so they're in a consistent format. And then I want to, then I want to change that and turn it into something else. But when I do that, and I'm going to do some transformations on that, as a user, I want to be able to see full lineage. I want to be able to say, this data came from this source. We brought it in using this, this transformation. We then wrangled it. We turned it into this new source, or maybe these new three sources. These will sit in Hive, maybe, or maybe they sit in HDFS. Um, but actually, I can see the full data lineage of that. And actually, as the data comes through, I also get the provenance around what happened in each step of the way. Uh, and as I mentioned before, we also have um, operations, so, so we can see on a nice dashboard what's going on. Uh, we can see the, unha on the unhealthy feeds as well as the healthy feeds. We can dig into those. We can see statistics on how quickly those feeds are running. We can even put data confidence levels around um, uh, whether a feed is healthy or not by the number of invalid records that are coming through based on the quality controls that you've put in. And we can also look at the, 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 the processing speeds of each of those feeds. We can monitor them. We can look at the, the statistics of those. And we can also see and put SLAs around whether they're completing within a certain amount of time. If you're a data scientist and you think, well, I, I can see all this data in my lake and that's great, but actually what I'd like to do is take four or five of these different tables, maybe they're in Hive, for instance, and I want to bring them out, I want to do some transformations. What we provide is we provide a wrangling UI where you can go in, you can pick those tables, you can search through them, you can join them together, and then we have a, we've exposed um, hundreds of functions, almost like an Excel function bar that allow you to um, manipulate that data, do group buys, do, um, do pivot tables, do more sophisticated things like, uh, like uh, uh, regression and a number of other functions, but really work through step by step and change that data into the form you want so that you can then create your own version, which of course we can then, using, using Kylo, we can then keep up to date um, uh, straight away. So we're very excited about this. We've brought it in, we've open sourced it to the community. Uh, we, we very much believe that open source is the way forward and we, 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 we really support that initiative. Um, but of course, with all of that, you need help doing that as well. So we have services to, to help you get started with Kylo, to, to, to also to um, uh, set it up, and also training to help you get started. So we have two days and four day training to help enable you. Um, but also we provide enterprise support, both from a foundation level, so before you're in production, we can help you get going and you can have some support uh, at pre-production level, but also 24-7 support once you are in production, uh, as you would need for any, for any large organization that's, that's putting this stuff in. Um, and, and of course, because it's open source, um, everything's available. We have uh, on kylo.io, we have um, all of a whole bunch of tutorials around how to do different types of things in Kylo. They're all video based, so you can follow them really easily. We also have um, uh, documentation, of course, uh, all the source code is available there. But also, you can go in and you can actually go into Amazon, for instance, and we have AMIs uh, freely available for 
all regions of the world, and you can literally just go into Amazon, into that marketplace, search for that AMI, click a button, and uh, it launches up Kylo with, uh, with, uh, um, uh, um, with Hadoop and, and all the other stuff that you need to get started straight away. So you can play with it to your heart's content. Um, uh, you know, straight away. Um, and on, in addition to that, we also have VM you can download. So it's very, very easy to get started. So really, I just wanted to give you that introduction. And uh, please come to our stand. We have uh, demos available. So please just come to our stand, uh, the Teradata stand. And um, we're more than happy to give you a demo and walk you through Kylo in more detail, answer any questions you have. And, um, and hopefully, you'll, you'll like what you see. Thanks for listening. Cheers. All right. Mike, thanks very much. Appreciate it. OK, so I encourage you to stop by the Teradata booth and learn more about Kylo if you're interested in that. Um, so I won't make any donut jokes. Uh, so what we're going to do now is, much like yesterday, we're going to go and get an outside perspective. One I think you, think, I think you will find is very, very interesting. Um, in this session, we're going to look at analytics and privacy and, and artificial intelligence and kind of some of the more human implications of that. So with that, and the title of this presentation is Making Technology Disappear. So I hope that's in the uh, figurative sense, not the literal sense. Um, so I'm going to introduce to the stage Dr. Ran Hindi to take us through that. Dr. Hindi. There he is. All right. Hi. Welcome. Thank you. Thank you. Great. Um, so just before I start, you have to know that I have a PhD, so everything I say has to be true, okay? Um, quick question. Did you ever feel something vibrating in your pocket, you pick up your phone, and there is nothing on it? Yeah? Do you feel that? Yeah, so mo most people did at some point. Uh, this is something that we call phantom vibration. It's literally when you think your phone vibrated, but in fact it didn't. Nine out of 10 people experience that. There's another name for that. Do you know what we call it? A hallucination. I, personally, I find that staggering that we've got so conditioned to technology that we're imagining things that don't exist. And when you look at what's happening with all those connected devices, you can see that there is an exponential trend in the number of devices we're gonna be interacting with. So try to picture this today. You've got a smartphone and a computer, and you're already imagining things that don't exist. What's going to happen when you're going to be surrounded by connected devices, when every lamp and chair and table is going to be connected? That, to me, is a big issue. And the reason is because the way that men and machines are currently interfacing is that you, as a person, have to make the effort of learning how to use the machine. And by machine, it could be software or hardware. It doesn't really matter. And so the cognitive load of adopting more technology is so big that you're basically becoming like a Pavlov dog responding to whatever that machine tells you to do. But there's no way this is going to scale to the Internet of Things. There is no way that you're going to have, you know, hundreds of billions of devices that you have to learn how to use. So this is where AI comes in. Because if you're using artificial intelligence, then you're able to make those machines adapt to you. So you can reverse the paradigm. You can speak to them, you can interact in natural language, they can start learning your habits, they can start anticipating what you want to do so that you don't even have to learn how to use them. Just as, just as you don't have to learn how to talk to someone else, you shouldn't have to learn how to use a machine. And when you look at what's happened with AI, recently there was this massive, massive acceleration in the capabilities of those assistants. And the reason is not because we invented some new algorithm. As it turns out, deep learning has been around for years. What happens is that there was a convergence of two exponential trends at the same time. The first one was GPUs and the, the very cheap price of uh, computing. The second one was the amount of data available to actually train those machine learning algorithms. There would not have been this AI revolution if we had not had the cloud computing and then the big data revolution before that. So the convergence of cloud computing and big data is what made AI all of a sudden explode. And when you look at this, what you realize is that the capabilities of artificial intelligence are going way faster than whatever friction those devices and machines are bringing. And so you can expect at some point in the future that the perceived friction of technology in your life is going to completely disappear. There's going to be a time in the future where you're going to be hyper-connected but you're going to feel as if you're completely disconnected. 
you're not going to be conscious of technology anymore because it's going to be so natural, intuitive to interact with it that you're not going to care. It's kind of going to be like electricity. It's going to be something that's ambient, something that's all around you. But you're not going to get into a room marveled by technology, just as you, di you didn't get into that room thinking, oh my god, there's light. You probably don't care. And so, you know, to me, artificial intelligence is basically a way to make technology disappear into the background. So what do we mean when we talk about AI? Well, many people have taught, gave you many definitions. I'm pretty sure if I ask every person here, everybody has a different one as well. Uh, the way I look at it is artificial intelligence is the ability for a machine to reproduce the behavior of a human. It's a very broad field of research with many, many different techniques and subfields. One of them, which is very popular, is called machine learning. The idea of machine learning is that instead of programming a computer, so instead of you know, understanding what's going on and programming it, you're getting examples of the behavior and you're letting the machine learn to reproduce that behavior. So you're moving away from programming computers into teaching computers. And the reason why machine learning is so powerful is because it's a lot easier to collect data than it is to figure out what's going on. And so you don't have to figure out what's going on, just give it to the machine and let it do it. And within machine learning, there is one specific technique called deep learning, which is very popular. Uh, so think about it this way. Deep learning is a subfield of machine learning, which is, which is a subfield of AI. And even though today you could probably use all three of them interchangeably because people usually use them as synonyms, this is really what it means. And in the future, you're going to see a lot of new work happening around symbolic AI again. So this is going to be a bit more differentiated down the line. Uh, I'm pretty sure most people are aware of how deep learning works, but here's a very simple abstract visualization. The idea is that you have all of those layers of data which are feeding into each other. And the objective is for this network to learn increasingly abstract concepts. So for instance, if you give it a picture of a cat, what it's going to do is going to take every one of those pixels of the image, and each of those pixels is going to go through the first layer. After combining those things for a few layers, it's going to learn by itself the concept of an edge. You've never told it what an edge was. It figured out by looking at many examples of pictures of cats that there was a common pattern that looked like an edge. A few layers down, it combined those edges into something that looks like a cat face. And so now it learned the concept of a cat, and so next time it sees a cat, it can tell you, oh, this is a cat. This works so well that you know, we can recognize things in pictures better than a human can. As a matter of fact, uh, image, uh, face recognition, you can, computers can recognize people in pictures better than people can recognize them people themselves. So a computer can recognize your kids better than you can recognize them in a picture. I, it's crazy. Right? You can use things called style transfer. I, I love this example. You take a picture, which doesn't look that good. You take a masterpiece, and you're basically training an AI to reapply the style of the masterpiece onto the picture. And so by doing that, anybody can pretend to be a Van Gogh. Next step you can actually generate pictures. That, I think, is amazing, actually. Imagine this. This is an experiment that was done. You draw a bag with your hand, whatever, like you just sketch something, it just generates a picture of it. It generates images, which, well, in 2017 look okay, but imagine in 10 years. Imagine what it means when you're a designer. Imagine what it means when you know, you're an architect. You don't have to do all the high you know, 3D rendering anymore. You just do like a quick sketch. Uh, people also use it famously, you know, to beat all kind of games. So you've probably seen, you know, uh, the world champion being beaten at Go. The way that this worked was actually quite interesting. They've taken a neural network, an AI, they've taken another one, and they've made them play against each other for like millions and millions of games. So in a few hours, it could play more games than a human skin in his, in his whole life. And at that point, it could beat the world champion. And Go was a very interesting game because contrary to chess, you couldn't calculate every possible move. You actually had to be good at the game. So it was a different, very different kind of AI than what we had for chess. So you know, all these examples, what it shows is that artificial intelligence is not something that is specific to a particular vertical. It's something that is kind of transversal. You know, just like you know, data analytics, just like big data before, is something that's going to permeate every industry in the future. Uh, there is one aspect in particular which I love, which is related to natural language. As it turns out, image recognition is pretty much done right, by computers, but language is still very complicated. 
You know, if you've already interacted with Siri on your phone, you're probably thinking, eh, it doesn't really get me. And the reason is not because it doesn't understand language, it's because it doesn't understand context. Something like asking for the weather in London or Munich, that's very easy because there is nothing ambiguous. Weather in London, weather is the action, London is the location. There is no, no other way to interpret what's going on. But if you're asking something a little bit more interesting, like find me an Italian near my Airbnb in London. Well, this is actually super complicated. First, you need to figure out that Italian is not a person. Because technically speaking, you could have a robot go out the street and ask people, are you Italian? Um, so you understand that this is a place type that you probably want to like, you know, search for a place on Foursquare or something. But then Airbnb in London isn't recognized as a location because this is neither an address or the name of a place. This is a contextual reference to something that makes sense to you. And the meaning of Airbnb in London for me is very different from Airbnb in London for you. And so the way that you're able to do this is you need to get data, a lot of other kinds of data. So you need to look at things like the location history of the user, uh, their emails, uh, their calendars, contact lists. Basically what you want to do is you want to recreate a very contextualized timeline of what people have been doing throughout the day by merging all the information with all their devices. And once you have that, you're actually able to use that in this kind of disambiguation screen. Oh, sorry, missed one slide. Uh, to understand that, okay, well, now I know that Airbnb is a location provider because I've got some emails from Airbnb. One of those emails is in London. The date seems to correspond to today. And so, therefore, this is what I actually meant as the address of uh, uh, my Airbnb in London. So, you see how by combining all those pieces of data together, you're able to add meaning and disambiguate natural language. Uh, this is the kind of stuff that makes it possible to have, you know, a home assistant. So this is the Amazon Echo. Went out in 2014. Everybody on the planet dismissed it as, oh, it's just another series, not going to work. Today, they sell over a million devices a year, and it's only available in English in the United States and the UK. I think in Germany as well, actually. Which is amazing. Right? They've created a new market, a new platform, a new device that everybody's now rushing into. There's an exponential growth in the number of capabilities people are adding to those assistants. But it's not going to stop here. What we see now with voice in particular is that there is a verticalization of voice assistants. So the Amazon Echo is a very horizontal kind of ask it anything sort of device. But what we see is things like, you know, uh, Bluetooth speaker companies adding music assistance. Because when you're in your, you know, your home and you want to change the music, you don't want to pick up your phone or something. You just want to, you know, tell, hey, play some Sinatra or something like that. All right, so you're having very verticalized assistance. Car manufacturer, big deal. This is going to happen very soon. You have to understand that a car is extremely hard to use. I mean, if you rent a car, Think about how much time you're spending just figuring out the buttons. It's hard, right? When is, this, you know, when is the winter and you've got fog on the screen and you're freaking out because you can't find a way to remove the fog and so you open the window and you're freezing cold? You could just tell your car, remove the fog. Right? That's how easy it should be. Right? And coming back you know, to this idea, you shouldn't learn how to use a machine. The machine should figure out what you're trying to do. You can use it in companion robots. So there's a lot of these coming out to the market. So small robots you can talk to, they can help you all kinds of different things. So a sort of you know, physical manifestation of those AI assistants. And this is not sci-fi, by the way. These are all companies that we're working with in my company. So this is real. This is the kind of stuff you're going to be able to buy, you know, if not this year, next year, because it takes a bit of time to produce, actually. Uh, from a design and branding perspective, what's interesting is that voice doesn't have any visual design. Right? You, you can't really, um, you can't design something visually like you would in all of this place. So instead what you do is you design the language of the voice assistant. Right? So things like accent, gender, the style of speech, the words you're using, the speed at which you're talking, the tone. Right? Uh, you could even imagine having it just like you transferred image style from one artist to a picture. You could imagine transferring the voice of a celebrity onto your voice assistant. And so you can start building branding into the voice by modulating the voice itself. So I think there's going to be a very big need for um, voice designers, essentially, which is not something that exists really today. So there's going to be a whole new category of jobs happening around that. Um, 
there is one more thing though that I think most people don't realize, don't usually realize is that by design, those devices are listening 24 seven. That's kind of the whole purpose because if they're not, they can't really reply to your, you know, hey Siri, whatever. And so people have been asking what's going on with all this data? Because let's not forget that voice is biometric. What that means is that your voice is as identifiable as your fingerprint. So when you're giving someone your voice, if they can apply that voice to their own algorithms, if you can do style transfer of voice, they can pretend to be you. And so many people are asking about that. And I think privacy is becoming a much, much bigger issue with AI and voice assistant than it has ever been with mobile and big data before that. And in particular in Europe, there is a new regulation, so I misspelled it here, I'm sorry, it's GDPR, uh, which forces company to adopt privacy by design principles. In 2018, every company operating in Europe will have to be, to uh, basically follow privacy by design principles. The idea of privacy by design is that you don't have a huge term and conditions with everything in it. Instead, what you do is you guarantee privacy in the way you're building your products, your algorithms, and your business in the first place. So taking again the example of voice assistance, well, maybe instead of sending everything to the cloud, you could actually process the voice on the device itself because that device is just a computer. And it turns out that today we've been able to make deep learning and voice assistant work on the equivalent of a Raspberry Pi. So when people tell you that you need, you know, huge amounts of data and computing power to run algorithms, that might be true for training the AI, but it's not true for running the AI. The reason why some of the big companies want all of the data is because they're doing something else with it. So you have to think about this, you know, and doing things on devices is not just good for privacy, it reduces, you know, bandwidth usage, it reduces, you know, server costs, it's actually very efficient. Uh, the second thing, and I think this is going to be one of the most radically transforming technology over the next 10 years. It's not yet ready, but people are working on it. It's something called homomorphic encryption. The idea is very simple, is that you want to be able to compute on encrypted data directly. So instead of sending the actual data to the cloud, you encrypt it and then you compute on it. So for example, take some location on a smartphone, encrypt it on the smartphone, send it to the cloud in an encrypted form, so the cloud does not have the decryption key, so the cloud has no way of knowing what it's looking at. But the way you've encrypted it kept some mathematical properties. So you can do addition, multiplication, you can run algorithms on the encrypted data directly. Produce a result which itself is encrypted, send it back to the user's device, which then has the key to decrypt it. When you're using homomorphic encryption, potentially everything you're doing on unencrypted data you could do server side on encrypted data, guaranteeing privacy without any impact on business. The only issue is that today, it's a billion times sm slower than not doing it encrypted. So that's why I'm saying it's not yet ready. But you can still do a few things uh, quite efficiently today, and people are starting to look into that. So you know, definitely keep an eye open for those types of technologies, because with all of those new privacy regulations coming onto the market and forcing people to be private by design, there is going to be a big demand for that kind of stuff. So, you know, why am I talking about all of this? Well, I'm talking about all of this because, you know, since I was a kid, people have told me that the future would look like something, would look like that, right? It would be a very futuristic looking city, big glass, metal buildings, huge ads all over your face, policing everywhere. But it turns out, when you actually talk to people and you ask them, what kind of future are you hoping to be in? Everybody kind of says that. People want to be at the beach. They want to feel disconnected. You know, they don't want to have technology in their face all the time. You know, they want technology to be helping them. They want to feel like, you know, they're not oppressed constantly. And to me, artificial intelligence is the way we're going to get there. Artificial intelligence is the way that we're going to make technology disappear so that we can actually feel like we're at the beach every day. Thank you. I have a little bit of time left, actually, I see here. You have more time. Huh? You have more time. 
Should we talk about something more? <laughs> no, I think that was actually very thought-provoking, actually, in terms of where you saw the uh, technology going and, you know, really the implications of, you know, data encryption, our voice. And I know a lot of people with those uh, Amazon Echoes, so I don't know if you have one or not, but... Well, th there's going to be alternative with privacy soon. Yeah? Okay. Well, no, it's very, uh, very thought-provoking. I think you gave everybody you know, something to, uh, to consider, um, particularly in all this technology that we're working with here. So, again, I appreciate it. Thank you it. very much. Thank you very much. All right, thank you. Okay. So, um, hopefully you found that as interesting as everybody else. I, I uh, saw quite a few uh, tweets about it backstage in terms of, um, you know, giving somebody, giving us all really something to think about as we work with the technologies, really both on the personal side and on the, uh, on the professional side. So, uh, given we have just a little bit more time, I'll uh, conclude with just the last couple slides. I want to say um, we do continue with the Community Showcase uh, Passport Program, so do continue to go through and you know, get your badge scanned with the um, uh, sponsors, with the community um, uh, that are participating in this plan. Again, you just need to go to all the booths in order to be available for the drawing. Again, it's for Bose uh, noise reduction headphones, so nice sit there. I want to make sure you do that. Again, thank you to all of our sponsors and all of our speakers that we've had here um, on the keynote. I think we've had a good kind of arc of technology and insight into how the technology is being used and the real value um, that's being used, and then some nice thought-provoking um, uh, session here from Dr. Hindi on you know, where AI might want to take us. So with that, I want to say thank you very much. Danke Flund. Thank you, friends. Um, and the next up for DataWorks Summit is in San Jose. So hopefully we'll see you out in uh, San Jose. Thanks very much. Enjoy the rest of the conference. Thank you.